Hi, I know that I am the thing standing between you and physical fulfillment. <laughs> I have the power. No, this is good. Well, so I'm going to make this as enjoyable as I possibly can for all of you. Uh, again, my name is Adam Cuppy. I come from a company called Zeal, or a consultancy. We specialize in web and mobile applications, and more specifically, uh, the reason why companies hire us or work with us is because we deliver certainty. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today centers around how we do what we do, but more specifically, technically speaking, how we do some of the things that we do, because we work with a lot of companies, most of them in Ruby, a lot of them in a few other frameworks as well. But there's a commonality amongst all of them, which is many of them have very similar problems and similar, uh, and similar technical problems that could be shared across multiple clients. All of that legalese being in place. But before we get too far, because I know the time wears along, here's what I want you to do, is I want you to just like stand up for a minute. Go ahead and stand up. All right, very good. Okay, and here's what I want you to do. Now, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to put your hands over the top of your head. So if you have anything in your hands, put it down. Hands over the top of your head. Okay, and I want you to count to 30, and I want you to just bounce up and down, and you're going to do this with your hands. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way to 30. Come on. There we go. Come on, hear it louder. Come on, here we go. Yes, 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 you're doing so well. You keep going, you got only five left. You've only got five left. All right, give yourself a round of applause. See? See, you don't even need lunch now. Okay, you can go ahead and take a seat. All right. So again, uh, I am here to talk about an all-important topic, which is extracting microlibraries uh, from uh, your, uh, extracting microlibraries and turning them into Ruby gems. Now, I'll give you a little bit of story around this. I've been in the software engineering field professionally for over a decade. Um, before that, I was an actor, so you can come from anywhere. I don't even have a degree. In fact, I've taken one technical class, like class in college my entire life. I'm not saying that to put down college or schooling uh, whatsoever. I'm just saying, you know, I think you can come from anywhere. But over the last 10 years, this was something that I had zero experience with. Uh, raise your hand if you have been in the Ruby community long enough to use a Ruby gem at some point in time. Okay, uh, now put your hand down. Raise your hand if you have never touched a Ruby gem in your life. Uh, as a, right, totally. Now here's the thing, and I want you to answer this honestly, because I'm gonna raise my hand to somebody who never has. I want you to raise your hand if you've ever built and published a Ruby gem from scratch. Raise your hand if you've published a Ruby gem from scratch. Fantastic, now put your hand down. And raise your hand if you have never published a Ruby gem from scratch. Fantastic, so we're like half and half, this is fantastic. Okay, so everybody that put your hand up just as a moment ago, put it up again. Okay, everybody that said that they've done it before, these are the people that you can be mentors to if they so ask, right? Because here's the deal, is I know that there are some maintainers here for some very popular gems, um, and I know that many of them would love some help and support at some point in time, so you can really help out the community by just being a mentor and kind of helping reiterate the incredibly brilliant content I'm about to show you. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so let's just start with some of the basics, because again, this is kind of like my journey. I didn't have any experience of this prior, so this is, for half of you, probably going to be a little rudimentary, but bear with me, because this is the content that you're going to have as a mentor with all your mentees now. Okay, so uh, we'll start here with the kind of basics. The first is, we've got a basic Rails application. Again, if you're dealing with Ruby, Sinatra, any other framework, all of them are going to work with, uh, with Ruby gems realistically, so let's just you know, forego the fact that this is Rails. If you don't use Rails, it's perfectly fine. But here's what uh, is really common in our world, right? Is you have a basic Ruby uh, Rails application. And what we found would be very commonplace is there is this directory under models that we might put some of, uh, some of our kind of uh, library-specific code that had nothing to do with our actual active record-backed models, right? Um, and this can be really common. I, I know that for many of us, if you've ever used Rails or many other frameworks, it's really easy to have what we like to call a God object, like a user model that's just overly bloated, it's got all this functionality in it because we don't know where else to put it. And for many of us, we know that, you know, extracting that out into something that's a little bit more specific to uh, its core function is probably a wise idea. Uh, sometimes that's not necessary, many times it might be, right? But in this example, so, you know, let's say we'll take our user model and uh, in this specific case, we had this little Gravatar little widget, right? And this little Gravatar widget was, you know, very simple, you can kind of see like it has an uh, avatar URL, a base URL, and then we pass in a hashed email address, and you know, then Gravatar does its thing, and when you pull up that 
URL, the, uh, the avatar itself would display, right? Pretty simple. And for the most part, you know, this is, this is really basic, and we find this oftentimes inside of our code base, is that we have just these little bits of code that seem to have almost no direct relevance to the user, but is only used with the user, or is only used with our active record model, and so we end up in this situation where it just is easy enough to put it into that code. But as many of us know, if we've had to deal with any applications that have been long-lived, this becomes a slippery slope really, really fast. Right? Before we know it, we're dealing with you know, different sizes of Gravatar URLs and different, you know, the different nature of it, and all of a sudden we have this user model where you know, only a third of it or less is actually pertinent to the user object itself, and everything else is all of this extra little lib code. Right? So we're gonna call this as like, this is not an ideal situation. We don't wanna necessarily be doing that. So what's often, uh, so what's really common is the first step is we would take this and we would extract this and move this into maybe a, a lib directory of some kind. And if you're familiar with Rails, there is this lib directory that's often used for these kind of one-off bits of code, right? Um, like in this example, you know, we have a Gravatar class and we just move those few bits of pieces of code into that, into that class and that, that separate lib file and then we include that lib file in. Um, we include that lib file in, and then we utilize it in our code base, right? This is a pretty common pattern in practice. So the problem with this, however, is that like in our situation, there's a lot of code that we write that gets shared across multiple domains, different applications. And so it's a really kind of, it becomes a real sort of hassle because what we end up doing is we end up copying and pasting all over the place, right? So, We'll say that while this is a good thing, this question about, well, what do we do with it? How do we handle that, right? So I want you to raise your hand if you've ever copy and pasted code from one application to another. Okay, so, good, right? So this, we will call it a problem, right? This is kind of a problem. Now, I wanna be really clear about this. This is not a dogmatic guide to when you should or should not do something. I'm just giving you an idea or a suggestion, ways to think about a problem like this that might pop up time and time again, and what you could do about it, okay? So if you are currently doing this, it may be perfectly acceptable. It may be a perfectly acceptable way to handle it. In fact, uh, there's a few instances where we might use like GitHub uh, GIS or something like that for a single file, and then we just very easily copy and paste it because maintaining a gem might be a problem, right? But again, this is just an option. Now, for the half of you that have never published a gem, um, please be honest, how many of you really are not or don't feel familiar at all with Ruby gems at all, like what they are? Okay, fantastic, okay. So we've all seen this, right? Um, and I wanted to, so I gave this talk a little while ago, um, and if you notice right here, I just wanted to point this out. If you notice, let's see if my little, my who did he? See this number right here? Uh, about a year and a half ago, that number was 10 billion lower. Billion lower, okay, so let's think about that for a second. <laughs> Right, the download count here for Ruby Gems is 16 billion, right? Billion, you know, that's where the little finger goes up and I make that joke, okay. 16 billion, like that is huge. There are a lot of gems that are pulled specifically from Ruby Gems. And this isn't just, this isn't the only gem server or public host for gem files, okay? And I'll go over that here in a little bit. But a lot of people that I talk to, especially newer engineers or less experienced, those who are less experienced to Ruby as a language or dealing with packages, which is what Ruby gems ultimately are, um, is we kind of get into this situation where you know there's just this magic behind the curtain thing, right? We're not as familiar with what load paths are, right? We just we require something and it kind of works, and we just sort of we don't really ask the deeper question of why does it work? What about it is working? If I had to replicate this, could I do that and how? Um, and, I, and that's perfectly fair. Uh, again, I, for a decade, I was writing software professionally, and this was something I was very unfamiliar with. So I think this is really commonplace for most of us, right? But just to answer the very fundamental and simple question, what is a Ruby gem? Just to clarify, is simply put, it's a, it's a simple package of self-contained collection of one or more files. It's really just that easy, right? There's not a lot of trickery that's happening or anything along those lines. There's some obviously very specific things that are occurring, but by and large, it's really just that simple, right? It's just a package of files. Now, there is some methodology, just like you have in a Rails app or a Sinatra app or you know, many other frameworks about where you locate files and the structure of uh, folders per se, but by and large, again, it's just important to remember these are just Ruby files for the most part. There's a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, that's true. Now, something that a lot of people don't fully realize is that RubyGems 
and Bundler are in fact two separate things, right? So Ruby Gems is the, is the concept around the package itself, right? And rubygems.org is a website to host and distribute those. Remember that count of 16 billion, almost 17 billion, right? That's, its, that's Ruby Gems function. Bundler, on the other hand, this is different. This is a dependency manager. So that is the delineation between those two worlds. A lot of people don't fully recognize that those are the differences. So when they think, oh, Bundler's not working, it might be the other way around or vice versa, right? Oh, my gem isn't loading and I blame it on Bundler, the way in which I'm running certain commands. That may just not be true. So it's important to remember that. Now, a Bundler, speaking about that here just br uh, really briefly, is a Bundler adopts what most dependency managers require and that is the notion of a manifest. And a manifest, again, for those who aren't familiar, is just simply a breakdown of all the different packages that, this that an application might require and or what versions of those packages that are required. Now, uh, raise your hand if you've ever dealt with a Ruby 2 or Rails 2 application or before, before the land of Bundler. Yes, my pain with you. We're actually gonna have a support group later. Because um, the reality was is if you ever had to live before the time of Bundler or at least Ruby's kind of core package management, man, I tell you what, like that, those are some war wounds, let me tell you what. Like that is some hard stuff. And mostly because it would come down to simple things like, you know, a simple variation. Like if you notice, um, if you can't see the slide, but like let's say example right here, uh, Uglifier, right? Uh, version 1.3.0 or greater. Well, uh, it could be a simple thing like you're running version 1.2 and your application is depending on version 1.3, right? I mean, we're all familiar with this, but could you imagine having ev to load every single version of every single gem manually onto a server? And if you were distributing that, like a serious pain. So when Bundler and Ruby Gems and that kind of, well, Bundler specifically came along, like this is a big win for everybody that was involved. Um, and so not going into too much detail because I would imagine that every, every one of you are familiar with something like this, uh, but just to remember that Ruby, this is not Ruby Gems. This is Bundler. This is the manifest that Bundler is creating. Now, uh, when you run Bundle install, we all see this, and I'm assuming you're all familiar with it, right? Which is, this is just simply telling us what variation of those gems happen to be used. Um, and of course, you know, we've just got the details, but again, it's good to remember that those are the Ruby Gems. Right, so where Bundler is managing the manifest and dealing with the manifest, uh, Ruby gems themselves are the, in fact, the packages themselves. Okay, so to break this down a little bit, because again, a lot of people, this is some of the magic that's happening that a lot of people might not be fully familiar with. So this is kind of the relationship between all of the above. So what we would have is we have rubygems.org, okay? So we've got like our Rails 5 gem or our spec core, whatever they are, it doesn't really matter. You know, we've got our, our laundry list of gems over there um, that are hosted. Um, by rubygems.org. Now, there's another option which I rarely see, but actually is a surprisingly smart thing to do because of the very core and uh, core dependency on this, on the Ruby gem service, is uh, to run a private gem server. Now, some what's most commonly understood for a private gem server is if you have libraries that you just clearly don't want to distribute publicly. Uh, that's the most common use of that. But there are other uses where it's literally, I'm going to use this as a form of proxy. So instead of relying on Ruby gems 100% of the time, and if that goes down, we have issues, I'm gonna do the opposite, which I'm gonna run a gem server to be able to support that. Uh, you don't have to by any means, but that's commonplace what, will ha uh, what could happen. Now, um, then what happens is when we run our bundle install command, what ultimately is gonna take place is those gems and the file, the packages, the actual files themselves are gonna move in to a localized copy, right? So the, the server itself runs independent of any third party service at that point, right? We're all familiar with that. Okay, fantastic. All right, so um, this was, uh, this is an example of like kind of the, the slippery slope that can often happen uh, really, really quickly. So uh, this is an example of an application we were working on where uh, there, was, there was a page object, and the page object needed to compare the differences between two hashes. And it was very simple functionality by and large, it just needed to know what was different or otherwise. Right, so we had this diff method up top here, and this diff method would just, you know, do some functionality, find the differences between the original and the modified versions. You know, really pretty straightforward. But if you notice down below, like the find differences method was a, a protected method, uh, down below inside of the page model. And like I was saying before is, like this is an example where you might have, you know, this delineation between what the responsibility of the page is versus some of the functionality that might need to, 
might need to do. Uh, and oftentimes the excuse I, I will most commonly hear, which is a perfectly valid one, but some to be my, something to be mindful of is, well, this is the only place this gets used, right? I don't, we don't use this for anything else, so why not put it here? It's totally reasonable. So there might be other reasons why it's valid to move it out of there. As an example, maintenance, right? Um, it's very common for applications that grow, and maybe you've experienced this in your own work, it's really common for applications to grow to have the team size grow, and then you have this sort of, uh, these team members that are split across multiple chunks of an application. Now, if you've ever had to deal with a monolith that's way too intertwined, uh, like there is this very clear association between the growth, the team size growth of a company and its inability to produce, <laughs> right? Because you have one large application and there's way too much dependency on, on the code itself. So this can be a really healthy answer, a healthy answer to be able to address this problem, which is, well, if, is this an opportunity here for to split this out into something separate where we have our own isolated tests around it, our own code around it, and we can, we can run scenarios and we can actually apply a team to maintaining that potentially uh, without uh, putting or, ter or not pulling down the effectiveness of the rest of the team? That's a question you can ask. Not always the answer, but it's a question to ask. All right. So. Uh, so what we uh, so what we're going to do here is I'm just going to show you what our answer to that. It was a very simple gem. So originally when I gave this talk, it was for RubyConf, and specifically it was a track around less code, so really small code bases. I think it was like 100 lines or less, something like that. And uh, what was common was I was asking about this uh, to some of our team members is they, they had one core assumption about a Ruby gem, and that was, oh, well, that's for big things, like RSpec and Rails and all that. And I was like, eh, have you ever seen LeftPad? Right? <laughs> Right, so like this is real. Like you can have small code bases that are isolated and are put into a Ruby gem. Again, it's a question you can ask, is this worth it, right? Sometimes it's not, just to be clear. Sometimes it can be, right? But so what we did is we decided that this is a great candidate uh, to move out into something separate, easy to maintain, something we could do. The code was relatively isolated. So I'll walk you through what we did. So the first thing we did, if you're not familiar, is uh, we created a base gem and uh, if you didn't know this, Bundler itself has built into it, so again, this is the, uh, the dependency manager tool. Bundler has a command called gem, and you can pass in certain, uh, like the very first option you pass in is the name of your gem, and then you can pass in additional options. And there's some really kind of cool options, but effectively what Bundler will help you do is it, it creates that boilerplate that you can build off of. So all of this kind of glue code that ties you know, your lib directories together and all that stuff, you now don't have to worry about setting any of that stuff up, right? Because things like the load path can be a real pain in the ass. Let's just get real. Like if you don't set up your load path properly, when you start to require things, things can just crash left and right and be very frustrating. So I've found this to be an incredibly helpful tool is just utilize uh, the bundle gem command to be able to build this. Um, and again, like you can check and see all of the different options that you can pass in here. As an example, pass in test and it will set up RSpec by default, but you can have it do many tests or other testing frameworks as well. So to kind of walk through what it is that it's doing, so the first thing that's really important that it, it creates, if you notice, is a version file. And the version file is specific for Ruby gems, right? So, well, kind of both, right? It's a little bit of the glue, uh, uh, the glue mechanism between the two, right? So without a version file, RubyGems squawks, blows up, you know, flips a table on your behalf. Uh, and so it, you have to make sure that you have a version file in here and that you're iterating on that file, right? It also assumes semantic versioning as well, uh, just to know that. Other files that it creates is it creates a default readme file and it puts in some really kind of nice, you know, to do, like make sure you tell someone how to use this sort of stuff, um, which if you do a, <laughs> Fun thing, go to GitHub sometime and just type in to do in the first line of what the readme file says, find out how many uh, repos are still never, have never written anything about what the thing is for. It's a good, it's a fun little trick. Um, the other thing that it generates by default is a code of conduct file, and this is, uh, this is an additional boilerplate that I think they added a couple of years ago. And then the last uh, interesting file is it will create also a, it will default to the MIT license. All of these things, uh, well, the last two specifically, you can turn off, disable, rewrite, however you choose, uh, but just know that it does a lot of this boilerplate for you. The other thing that it will add in, like I was mentioning before, is some test support. So because I had 
uh, added the test flag as an option to the end, which it automatically is assuming our spec. Again, you can change it to mini test or your, your personal flavor. Um, it'll automatically include files to support that, specifically an R spec um, dot file for configurations, as well as a spec helper file. And then, of course, it's going to create the first structure around your, it's going to assume a spec structure that's aligned to the classes, the unit structure inside of your gem itself. But it'll set up some of these basic stuff. And you also notice that there's even a Travis YAML file as well. Um, again, you can turn that stuff off too. Okay? So, uh, again, as a reminder, this is just simply a collection of files. Like, that's, that's all we're talking about here. There's nothing more complicated or screwy that's going on. It's just a collection of files. If you want to learn more about this, you can put help. You can prepend the gem command with help, and it, it spits out a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, so walking through this pretty quickly. Um, is so basically we created this gem called hash diff and inside the folder structure which is really basic there's a basic lib directory there's a bin directory and a spec directory um, other options might include an execu executable and I know that for some people in the room that uh, are concerned about security executables and Ruby gems are like one of the greatest risks any application can possibly have um, because they auto execute Right, so once you install it, it auto-executes the file, so just be very mindful of that, um, an important thing. Uh, but anyway, so we've got some folder structure here, and it created this kind of base, this very simple root, uh, root file for the hash diff gem that we're creating. And you know, there's this really nice comment that just reminds you that your code goes here. The irony is that generally you don't put your code there, though. That's just what's kind of funny about it to me. Um, oftentimes, this is just utilized to set up the namespace, and then you'll put in your lib directory the code itself, right? Um, like I was talking about before, we've got a version file. Um, and this is still all Ruby. So if you look at the gem spec file, which I'll show briefly here in a minute, um, you can use any sort of Ruby you would like here. This is just the convention they set up. And the convention being, within the root module, there's a constant that represents that, represents a string that is whatever that version happens to be. But you'll notice in a lot of gems, they'll break this up, so they've got like a major, major version constant, minor and patch version. It's all Ruby, like that's all that it is, right? And if you look a little deeper, you're gonna see where it gets used and how it gets used. There's not some big, you know, big magical concept that's occurring, it's just convention, okay? All right, so then what we did is we're gonna move our code in here. Another thing that's really awesome about a Ruby gem specifically, and uh, or not just a Ruby gem, but utilizing an external library is by convention they're going to assume uh, they're going to assume that you want to namespace your code inside of a common namespace to avoid collision. Uh, again, something that we incur or we experience a lot is once you start to copy copy code over or something, if it's not namespaced there's a very high probability that things might collide if you're using a relatively common word. But with this, as all you Rubyists know, like if you're using, let's say, user as an object or something that's uh, relatively common, you now run into fewer issues. Not no, not no issues, but fewer issues, right? Um, and so, yeah, so we've just created our object here, and here's some of the code that we had sprinkled in there. You know, fancy, you can see it online if you'd like to look at it, but that's not necessarily the relevance here. So we moved all the code in, we've got now a contained library, the whole thing is, is totally built and structured for uh, use inside of our application. So if we run our tests, uh, by default there will be a base rate command that just runs all of your tests, which is obviously super helpful. A lot of people don't realize that that is an actual declaration you have to make, and they make it, right? So a lot of people just think, oh, if I just run rake by default, it'll just do all these things. No, there's actually a declaration somewhere that says to do those, do that stuff. So as a side note, but this is something that's going to come with this. Um, obviously, all of our tests pass because, you know, uh, all of our software is perfect. So we have never have had any issues ever once. All right. Um, and then the, here's just basically the commands that you can do to run that. Obviously, the bundle install command, the rake command, all that stuff. We're all familiar with that stuff. All right. So to review this very briefly, uh, the gem spec file, for those of you who have never done it, built a gem before, you might have still looked at this, um, but the gem spec file is just a specification file that, spe that uh, basically tells Ruby gems or anything that's, that's reading from uh, this gem itself a little bit about it, right? So you're going to notice things like, oh, so this is the name of the gem. Uh, remember when I was saying that there was a version number that mattered, right? You're going to see that all it's doing is calling to the constant. There's no other magic that's happening, right? And it has to require the version file before. Again, no more magic, it's just Ruby. Um, 
And then we've got some author details, email details. Most of this information is gonna be fed into rubygems.org when you look up a gem, right? This is where this information is. This is, this is you modify this and it modifies that. It's really that simple for the most part. Um, and then homepage, summary, license, what we're dealing with here. Uh, this, uh, as a side note, this talk was done before some modifications have happened, so your gem spec file is likely to look a little different than this, but by and large, it's all the same. Just know the most important thing is, if you want to change the name, the author, information like this, this is where you go. You probably don't always want to change the author, but this is where you're going to look for that. Um, and then down below here, uh, this is a little different of a path. This is a difference of, uh, from what is normally done within a gem file. Uh, but you're going to notice at the very bottom of the file that there's some automatically included dependencies, right? So just like a gem file, this is, in essence, the same sort of manifest ideals that are done but for a gem, uh, a Ruby gem itself, right? So you see the same stuff. Here's the name of my gem. Here's the version of my gem, just like you'd see in a gem file, right? So all familiar with that, yes? Fantastic, okay, and if you're not, remember the people that raise their hand, they can, they can help you, or I can help you, of course. All right, um, and speaking of this real briefly, so uh, if, you, like, if you actually look at the gem file, because it's not gone, so we were just looking at the gem spec file, but inside the gem itself, there is also a gem file, right? And you probably notice this, right, that in these, it's actually wanting you to utilize the gem spec file, if I were just looking at, okay? But also know that you can use this, it's just not recommended to use this. Um, and like I, like I was saying before, if you look at a new ver version of the gem spec file, if you've generated a gem, you're gonna notice there's a slight change in here too, but same sort of principle, right? Uh, they all basically do the same thing. Okay, and then I'm just pointing out here the same stuff. Okay, so the last thing is to build the gem itself and publish it. So I'm gonna walk through the way Ruby gems uh, Ex expects you to do this, but there's actually a better way. So for all of you that are like, oh, I don't do it that way, that way's stupid. I'm gonna show you the way I do it, okay? So you're gonna all be cool, we're all gonna be fun, okay. So the basic is this, right? So uh, the gem command, not bundle, but the gem command itself um, allows to kind of build off of the gem spec. So if you were to run the command at the bottom here, we all know, I think we all know what CD does, but if you were to run the command here at the bottom, um, it's going to generate an output very similar to this, and it's gonna generate a .gem file, okay? And this is the very basic output that it's gonna do. It's also going to, uh, um, it's going to append uh, the version to it, so as you continue to build gem files based on new versions, there you kinda go, okay? Um, so this is the kind of base expectation for when you build a gem, but there's other steps, like pushing it to Ruby gems and what do you do beyond that, right? So luckily there's a fancy command called push. You can do the same thing, and it will do exactly that, right? It'll take your built gem. If, you're, if you may stay in the same directory and you hit push, it's gonna push that gem up, and boom, everybody is famous, right? You are famous just like all the other awesome Ruby gem creators in this room, right? Uh, but there is, like to all of you probably know, there is a much simpler way to do this that adds a little bit of additional simplicity, and it's a rake release command. Uh, so there's a command that uh, just baked into rake that will do uh, three core functions all in one fell swoop. So it kind of prevents the need for having to know the little details in there or knowing anything super unique. Uh, the first thing it will do is it'll actually create a tag, a git tag in your git repository. So it marks that, that SHA to that, uh, ver that tag itself, right? The other thing it will do is it will publish to GitHub automatically, so it's assuming that there's a remote repository attached to that, to that, uh, that Git repository as well. If you don't have it, it squawks for good, important reasons, so it'll encourage you to do that. And then the last thing is it will do the publishing, so it'll do that last step of gem publish, right? So I highly advise you use this instead. So this falls outside of bundler and gems, but it's an actual rate command, but this is a lot, it creates a lot more consistency in the output and the expectation. Okay, and then when you do that, you get this little, you can head over to Ruby Gems and you can look how famous you are, right? Um, and yeah, you can see, like you see details about the authors from the gem spec file, it will track all the versions. Again, this is probably stuff you've already taken a look at, but most of this data is driven off of the gem spec file and off of Ruby Gems itself. And again, this is Ruby Gems, not Bundler, okay? So this is not associated to Bundler itself. Now then inside of our application, now we can start to use um, our new gem. Now, just for the sake of demonstration, I put it up here at top. You can put the file anywhere you like, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but 
just for demonstration, right? So now we can include our gem with our version number, and then we run bundle install for our application. That's what we're looking at again, is this is our app. Uh, then see, now you can see that you're famous, right? This is what famous people look like, it's right here. This is, <laughs> this is, this is famous people, no, just kidding. Um, but yeah, same methodology is, is used the exact same way. Now the thing I have not gone over is any configuration around private gem servers. So if that is something that makes sense in your organization, uh, there's only a small subset I found that do, that does make entire sense for. Just know I didn't go over any of that, and I would recommend taking a look at the docs. Now, inside of the gem, I was mentioning the load path, and this is the thing a lot of people never, a lot of developers just never have to deal with, um, and it is also a part of the boilerplate, so we almost never have to deal with it either. And the load path is just helping tell Ruby where to find that code, right? So at the top, you notice our little our arrow up here. So now we can require our hash diff gem without having to call to the specific location in our file system, none of that stuff. It's just gonna require that. Well, that's some of the boilerplate that's included in the Ruby files. Again, it's all just Ruby that's written into the gem that we just produced, okay? So it's actually, actually it's in the gem spec if you look back at that, okay. Um, and then now we can use our library. So. Uh, we can now use our hash diff library, and there's a diff module in there. Uh, a few people have asked, like, I don't see this code in there. Uh, we simplified it a little bit, and I just glossed over that portion of it. This is just a basic method that we included um, on the module. So, you know, don't be alarmed. There's no, there's no Ruby gems or bundler magic happening. It's all just Ruby, nothing too special, okay? And then, of course, we are now super, super famous, all good. You know, we can use our stuff. So again, going over the, the new release process. Again, many of you are gem maintainers, and so this is something, or if you are involved in the open source community, community which I encourage all of you to at least dip your toe into, uh, to know if it's for you, because it's a great opportunity for everybody to participate, uh, you may be involved in new releases. So the new release process is very simple, right? You just modify the code, whatever you're gonna do, you make sure to increment your, increment your version constant, remembering that the, the base methodology is, is semantic versioning, versioning, excuse me. So just remember that, you're gonna implement, uh, increment that, and then you're gonna rebuild and release. So the same rake command. So rake release, it'll do the same thing, push it where it needs to go, tag it, and all the above. All right, uh, and then of course we can update our gem and our application. Now. Glossing over this quickly, um, so what are the pros to this approach? And this is, again, as a consultancy, this is something that we deal with a lot. A lot of code that gets shared, what do we do about that, given that everybody's okay with it being shared, um, what are the pros? Well, some of the pros are, of course, like I was talking about before, you have isolation. So you have code that is isolated away from other domains. Um, what I have actually found as being a really good thing in regards to that is it keeps a real tight focus on what does this code have to do versus what is the stuff that we're using it for, right? So what is this code's domain? I think that's a good and healthy question to always be asking. So being in isolation has turned out to be a great idea. Um, not for everything, but for a few things. The other thing that we realized was managing upgrades. So as a consultancy, we work with a company for, you know, let's say a few months or a year, what have you, and then we might roll off but this is code that they are dependent on. Well, we continue to upgrade it and manage it and monitor it. And so if we decide to make it, to iterate on that code, make it a little better, security patches, what have you, um, then we can just notify that team without ever having to step back in and help. We can just say, hey, just so you know, there's a new release to this. You might want to upgrade at some point in time. And they can do that all internally without ever having to get involved with us again. Um, and then of course, the hope, I think with anything open source is that you now have community support, which again, I recommend to anybody, like dip your toe in if you have not dipped your toe in at all, because uh, I just was having a conversation with maintainers of gems, and uh, if you're not familiar with the term bus number, the bus number is really low for gem maintainers of stuff that we use every single, literally every day, if not multiple times a day. So, uh, you know, hopefully if nothing else, if there's like this kind of, uh, this mist around like how this all works, that this kind of removes that burden so that now you can maybe jump in at least have a better understanding of how you could contribute. Generally speaking, this is kind of my sort of rule around this, which is extraction encourages isolation. Isolation encourages a simple interface and a simple interface is more maintainable, right? So encourages is the operative word here. Uh, it doesn't always mean that will happen. It just means that it could encourage that it will happen at the very least. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to fail in this, but uh, this generally can encourage that pattern if you put a focus on it. Now, here's the very realistic cons. 
The biggest is now you have an external dependency to manage. And this is probably the number one criticism I hear is, oh, now I gotta manage that thing. Yes, you do. Uh, that is true. But if you look back at other the, uh, the other values that might exist and how those apply, it might very well be worth it, right? And so as a team, you just have to think about that stuff. Um, I think there's, in the Rails community, there's a lot of criticism specifically around Rails engines because they're this interesting hybrid between a, a full application and a gem as far as an ex or uh, not a gem, but an external library. And the criticism is, okay, well, there's too much of a tie between these two things and now they've actually become burdensome um, as an external dependency. So again, there's a lot of opportunities here for this, but to remember that that's very real. And then of course, there's always gonna be additional development overhead because especially if it's open sourced, you're probably gonna have people that have critiques, criticisms, or new needs. You just gotta know about it. Um, I don't think it should necessarily shy you away from it, but uh, some you have to be very cognizant of in my opinion. And then the last is the double-edged sword of community support, right? So you either have it or don't, or do, and then don't again, right? So it's just a thing to kind of remember. And specifically, like I was talking to Sam Fippen, who maintains RSpec Rails, and like the sheer quantity of people that utilize RSpec, yet he is basically, that library is almost a bus number, almost entirely a bus number of one. Bus number as a term is how many people have to be hit by a bus before something goes totally under, if you're not familiar with that, right? So it's kind of an example of that is like this is, he is a team of one for the most part that's maintaining something that is used by so many applications in so many places every day. So the big and fundamental question is when is the right time? And this is the way that I would answer it, but again, have your own, which is it's when the cost of maintaining an internal library exceeds the cost of maintaining an external library. So if maintaining the internals of it, because on a team of 20 or a team of 30, it's just chaos trying to like get through it, then it might, it might be worth it to look at externalizing that. Something to think about. Okay. A uh, couple of quick gems. I won't go over these. You can find these on the slide deck later. Um, yeah, Gravisaurus Hex was, uh, I actually turned that the Gravatar thing into a ridiculously small gem as well. You can look at that and critique that one too. It has had a while, I wanna show this out. It has had a whopping 356 downloads. You know how many of those are bots? Well, all but two, right? <laughs> but just know, I mean, for this version alone, look at this, this has versions, 140, I mean, I'm famous, all right. <laughs> All right, um, okay, last two things I'll point out is just the guides. Uh, just know that there's two sets of guides. They overlap in a lot of ways, so this adds to the confusion of what's Ruby Gems versus what's Bundler. Uh, but this is the guides on Ruby Gems. Look how wonderful this is, is your first gem. We love that. Um, act, adding executables, don't do that. Well, you can do it, but it's... Uh, that's her review that, <laughs> there you go, okay. Um, I have found that the updated docs on Bundler are fantastic, more specifically, because they actually implemented some of this functionality, so that's awesome. Um, so you can look at both of those. I definitely recommend reading it, get familiar with it. Ruby gems are something we all use every single day for the most part, so if you're not familiar, write a gem if you never have. Uh, kill it later if you're concerned about community support or you don't want to put it out there any farther, but just get used to it. The last thing I'm going to share with you, and then I swear to you I'm going to be gone, is uh, my company just released a podcast that I would love some developer feedback on. So if you go to podcast.codingzeal.com, here's what we do as a team, is every single morning during our stand-up, we have an area called interestings, and it's like stuff we've read across the internet, developer news, you name it, and then we discuss it in the morning. And so what we'll do is then uh, one of our team members is like, hey, I would love to do like a 15 minute like weekly podcast where all we do is just chat about one of the things that's really interesting. Uh, right, I, I don't know, we probably have 50 subscribers. It's not a whole lot. And I'm not necessarily looking for subscribers unless you find it valuable. What I'm the most interested in is I'm really looking and interested in the things and the topics that you find interesting and whether or not we're talking about that stuff. So if you have a chance, they're short, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. You get to hear about a bunch of us babble on a little bit. But if you wouldn't mind, take a look at this, give us your thoughts, feedback, Hit me on Twitter, whatever you like. I would love to hear your thoughts. All right, that's it. Thank you so much. I hope I was helpful.